Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. Um, good morning, everybody. Um, everybody sitting awake? Um, so, my talk is about seven deadly deployment sins. Um, it's not to be taken too seriously. Um, it's more of a like, thought-provoking, entertaining talk. Um, who am I? I'm Philip. I'm from Vienna, so kind of around the corner. I'm with Elastic. We're the company behind Elasticsearch, Logsearch, Kibana, Beats, good old Elk stack. Anybody using Elk or Elasticsearch? Ah, that's very good. Um, <laughs> if you want swag, um, I have loads of stickers here for you, for your colleagues, for your kids, neighbors, whatever. Um, take as much as you want afterwards, uh, so we've got you covered. And also in Vienna, I'm running meetups. Um, so if you ever come to Vienna, I'm running a meetup on databases, and I'm doing one on more academic papers where we discuss like the theory of things. Like at the moment we're more focused on machine learning because it's the hot new shit, obviously. Everybody needs to do machine learning. Yeah, and at Elastic, I'm an infrastructure team, so I'm, we're the team who does AWS, Jenkins, Ansible Scripts, Chef, Puppet, all those stuff. And I always describe it like the previous slide you could see. I'm an infrastructure and I kind of pipe that into developer advocacy. So I'm out at lots of conferences doing talks. Yeah. So, any confessions? Any deadly sins you, you or your applications are committing? Um, like, the whole thing will be styled uh, just like the movie Seven. So we'll walk through the seven deadly sins. I hope you can kind of remember the film because we will get back to that every now and then. Um, so no confessions up front? No? Uh, let's see, maybe you will find where you're guilty. Um, which one is this? Which sin? Gluttony. Exactly, gluttony. Uh, the overindulgence and overconsumption of everything, anything to the point of waste. Um, which can be, for example, add all independencies. <laughs> Who is in the Java ecosystem? Show of hands. Okay, just a few. Um, so I have kind of this partly uh, Java background, and there this is like, ah, we have more modules, let's add all the things. And at some point you find out, well, Permian space or Metaspace, which it is now since Java 8, is not that happy anymore because you need to load all that stuff and at some, at some point it gets kind of heavy and you find out, well, maybe I should have been a bit more careful. Um, and you also feel it if you have your big jar or war files and you need to transfer them around. Um, suddenly your simple fat jar file is 150 megabytes and you need to distribute that and push it around and stuff gets some, somehow more painful than you were expecting. And also storing all the artifacts of this, like if you have lots of iterations, it's, yeah, it doesn't feel as nice as it could be. So for example, you want to put stuff on a diet. Um, so who is using AWS? Just so few, okay, this is a very German-speaking thing, because internationally, everybody is just, yeah, cloud, awesome, let's do cloud. And German-speaking world is always, yeah, it's our own service. <laughs> but, okay, so if you're using AWS and you just want to interact with a single of service from there, from them, previously you had one fat jar file, which was nearly 13 megabytes, so if you just wanted to access a single component, for example, S3, the file storage, which I always call glorious FTP, you would add a 13 megabyte dependency to your project just for a few API calls. And that's kind of heavy and stupid. And at some point they kind of noticed and said, well, yeah, we see this is not how it's supposed to be. And they split it up. So they have now just a base um, SDK, which is nearly nothing. And you just include all the stuff you will need. So. Stay with me if you're not a Java developer, this is Maven. Um, <laughs> you probably don't want to use it uh, unless you have to because it's all XML and yeah, a bit cumbersome. But what you do normally is you just uh, import this base dependency which also provides the version and everything. And then you just say, I just want this specific dependency. For example, if I just want to use, use F3, this is all I want. And this will add, I don't know, a few tens or hundreds of kilobytes but it will not add 30 megabytes to your project. So this is the kind of stuff you want to do um, to keep your project lean. Um, on the other hand, you can totally overdo that. Um, 
I'm, I'm sure everybody knows, like, Bill Gates once said, said or is said to have said, uh, 640k ought to be enough for anybody. And with Node, there is now this, they call it the 640k challenge. Write a project with less than 640k uh, dependencies. Because in Node, every single thing uh, is a dependency. Who, who got the uh, left pad fiasco? Anybody notice that? There, there was the thing, like in, in, in the JavaScript ecosystem in Node, everybody is just writing a dependency for three or four lines of code. And then you have like all, all the meta information around it is probably like 10 times the amount of code. And some of you uh, wrote um, a left pad. So it would just be say, um, I have five characters, but it should be 10 characters long, and I just want to pad it with spaces on the left hand side. And somebody wrote the module for that. Totally obvious. Uh, and then that person had, I think they had some legal dispute, they were, they were put, uh, pissed off for some reason, and then they simply removed their dependency from NPM, the registry where the node dependencies are stored. And it kind of broke the internet, <laughs> which was just all the other dependencies. I think, for example, Babel, the transpiler, uh, relied on that package. And with Babel, you broke um, React and loads of other stuff. And everything just because of one single dependency, which was probably five lines of code or 10 lines of code. So it's, if you look at it, it's kind of like, why would you ever use a, a dependency? Unless you're from the Node uh, world where you would create dependencies just for three lines of code. So yes, um, splitting up huge stuff is kind of a good idea, but you can definitely overdo it. Um, other thing, you probably want to combine all the projects. Um, but at the moment, we're kind of on the other side of trends. Um, so everybody needs to do microservices. Um, yeah, this is probably what kind of, or this is always how I picture the microservice thing. Uh, you have, ideally, you combine it with containers. Um, so you simply throw around your containers, and then you have them yeah, floating around independently, because you know, it's all this glory. Uh, you get rid of all the coupling, um, and then life is much better. Um, but why stop with microservices? Um, I've seen people, microservices are too big, so we, the next step is then nanoservices. And if you go further, you end up at Pico. And kind of the smallest thing I could find is Yocto services. Because there's nothing smaller. I'm not sure the Greeks have found anything smaller than Yocto. Um, so once you have uh, reached Yocto services, you're good because it's at most a single line of code again, uh, but you can run it independently and then scale it independently and just put together whatever uh, you want to do. Um, and in theory, it always looks great. Like, for example, if you have a model, and that is kind of what you picture in your head, and this is what reality looks like. Like, <laughs> somebody pictured that like, if models actually looked like uh, what the, uh, the drawings looks like in reality, this is what you get. And there is, this looks kind of nice. This is probably not as nice as it could be. And sometimes I get this feeling with microservices as well. Like in theory, it's super nice. And yeah, drawing, you're drawing all your microservices. And once you run them, um, it feels like more anorexic services than microservices. Yeah, and of course, um, thank you, Gartner. This is probably the only useful thing Gartner ever done, has done, uh, is the hype cycle. So, Depending on where you stand on microservices, we're either either here or here, I don't know. Uh, some might have ended up here. Um, by the way, who is actually using microservices in whatever loose term you want to call them? Um, okay, where are you? Kubernetes. No, 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 like in the hype cycle. <laughs> still, still on top? Between slope of enlightenment and, and proof of delusionment. Ah, okay. <laughs> yeah, okay, that, that, that's actually kind of a, a good point. Like, once you have gone through here, uh, it can only get better, so <laughs> lucky you. Um, and sometimes people will then come to me and say, well, you're also negative about microservices. And no, I'm, I'm not. Like, maybe um, this is the problem you have. Like, if you have too many people, um, if you have too many dependencies, if you have stuff that needs to be scaled independently, microservices are definitely great and can help. But it's, again, it's always sold as a silver bullet and unfortunately in IT there are no silver bullets. 
Um, there is no one size fits all, whatever solution, it's just not. Um, you cannot just use microservices and all your problems will go away unless you have the right problems. And many people don't have the right problems. Um, yeah. So, just to sum it kind of up, will uh, microservices solve all your problems? Um, bad news? Um, no, it's not. Um, and another thing you should always keep in mind, um, this is kind of my papers background, uh, people have done lots of clever stuff over the years. Um, the eight fallacies uh, of distributed computing from some microservices still, who knows those? Who has heard those? Oh, very few. Okay, um, it is stuff like... Uh, Network's always available. Exactly, the network is reliable, latency is zero, bandwidth is infinite. <laughs> and all of these things like um, distribution is fine, but it's kind of a trade-off. And well, while you take away some po uh, pain points on one side, it adds new pain points on the other side. And you just need to find where does it hurt, hurt most or least. And if you add pain points from the wrong side, stuff will just get worse. And there is a more up-to-date blog post from Jeff Hodges. He has been a Twitter engineer. Uh, he has been involved in Let's Encrypt, and he's done lots of interesting stuff. And from his time in Twitter, he wrote uh, notes on distributed systems for young bloods. I think he's still younger than 30 or around 30, so yeah. <laughs> Maybe he's still a young one as well, and the main differentiation he makes is that distributed systems are different, not because of latency or something, uh, but because they fail often, and components will fail independently. And this is something you need to take into consideration, and your application will need to be able to cover. Like, if you have stuff that works independently, uh, good. But many applications are not really written in the fashion that if one piece uh, fails, the rest will just work or still work as well as it can on its own. Um, if you cannot do that, microservices are probably a bad idea. And yes, of course, there are all these tools from Netflix and whoever uh, is using highly distributed systems, which makes life easier. But it's again, it's a pain point. And then there are the people who say, oh, finally, it's SOA done right. Who has done SOA previously? Yeah, OK, who is a bit older already? Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Yeah, uh, there, there was this time, I, I've just missed it, I think, where it was services, 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 Let, everything is a service, yeah. and you had this thing, it's WS Death Star. <laughs> who, who has worked with WS Death Star, like all the WS whatever, WS security, WS transaction, uh, yeah, you had all of these things. And it was kind of painful, and now with microservices, it's kind of all better. Um, but kind of problems still remain. Um, Who is using Wireshark? Great tool, right? Unless you're in a highly distributed fashion, because then it's more a murder mystery. <laughs> like you can run Wireshark here, and you can run Wireshark there, and it's just like you get little bits and pieces of information. So yeah, this like distribution stuff is not always helping and making everything easier. Also for tooling, like it's really an investment. You with all these highly distributed systems. It is an investment you need to make. Um, and sticking to Star Wars, what do we have here? Okay. The Death Star. Yes, um, or you could say two microservices and their shared database. <laughs> because as soon as you have just one big database for everything, um, your microservices are probably not as independent and isolated as you wish they were. And those like scaling them up and down and like making schema changes and stuff. Um, it's just not as easy as you were expecting. So if you have this big fat database in the, in the back, and then you have all your nice little microservices floating around, you probably have as much independence as these little two starfighters floating in the galaxy. Um, without their mothership, they cannot do too much. So yeah, again, it's probably not saving you. Um, and there are smart people who say, don't even consider microservices. Uh, unless you have the complexity uh, to manage something as a monolith. Um, yeah, start off with a simple monolith, um, but pay good attention to modularity. And don't split it up into microservices too early, which my father said, and he wrote quite an interesting blog post about it. And I kind of shared his opinion that microservices totally can solve your problems, but it's just like because the big 
important successful companies are doing it doesn't mean that you should do it as well and just to give you another idea like this is what your stack used to be in 2005 even if you cannot read the independent pieces it's just like okay we have four components you can probably keep that system in your head whereas good 10 years later this is what your microservice architecture looks like looks like and probably you cannot keep that in your head as easily and logging, debugging, and everything probably gets much more complicated. Um, if you have a huge team, awesome. You're responsible just for this component, and you, you focus on that. Um, works well, is good, but if you're just a small team, if you have more than one microservice per person on your team, you're probably doing it wrong. And then there are the people who say, uh, we just need a fancy name for the big old monolith, because monolith sounds so dirty by now. Uh, we just need to rename it. So I have some suggestions like mega platform, uber container, or stereolith. And I really like stereolith. Um, you just, we just need to find a fancy name, because it's always flowing the key routine at some point, and we've had this multiple times. Like You have big fat things, and then you have kind of small things and highly distributed. And it's always going back and forth, and people will find pain points on one side or on the other side. And yeah, I assume at some point, once uh, we find out, oh, we can put, I don't know, a terabyte of RAM into a single computer, uh, probably the, the old monolith doesn't look that bad anymore because it's just one huge box, you save on all the, the failure points, you save on all the network overhead and all the things. Big old monolith is probably um, still good. Or another term I've heard since serverless is all the rage now, um, server full for the mo uh, monolith as the next step might be a nice addition as well. Um, yeah, and one other thing which we've kind of alluded to it, like small and simple microservices, this is the good part, and kind of the bad part is that the complexity you've had needs to go somewhere, and you're just pushing down the complexity into the integration layer with microservices. So the complexity doesn't just disappear, you're just moving it around. And like I've said, pain points. If the if the complexity of a single service is your pain point, this might be a solution. But if you, it is not, um, just pushing the pain into some other place is just not helping you. Um, yeah, and Sam Newman, he is also very well, well known in the microservice world, and he's actually a big proponent of microservices. But he is like, just this week tweeted, and even he, who is a proponent of microservices, uh, that for small teams, it just doesn't really make much sense. And to conclude, everybody repeat with me, I'm not Facebook, Google, or Amazon. Like, just because they're doing it, it's not what I should do. Okay, next thing. Okay, this is easy. It's written on the floor. Um, <laughs> uh, greed. <coughs> Excessive or rapacious desire and pursuit of material possession. And I have a single slide for that. Um, who remembers that one? <laughs> I mean, it has been renamed now and everything, and I hope nobody from our, uh, Red Hat is here, right? Good. Um, so, I, I had my own history with that. I think it was 2006 or something. I don't even know which Jabo's version it was, but I can still remember it took five minutes to start up, and after three redeploys, it was out of memory, and one redeploy took 90 seconds, and then after three times doing that, uh, you had to reload the whole server, and that was super painful, and it was just too greedy resource-wise, and at least for smaller projects, it to me never made sense. So don't be the old JBoss, maybe Wildfly now is much better. It's okay. faster, but it's still <laughs> okay. Yeah, Yeah, I've tried to stay away from the whole um, application server ecosystem for quite a while, yeah. So, who remembers that one? Which sin is that? Sloth. Exactly, sloth. Uh, physical laziness, but also spiritual laziness. Um, yeah. Who's doing continuous integration? Fill and test every push. Okay. Who is not using it? Okay. <laughs> who is too afraid to admit it or who is already sleeping? <laughs> okay. Um, yes, this is definitely something I'm, I'm all for. Like, 
Whenever you push something, uh, build it and test it uh, so you don't find out a week later you broke everything. Um, continuous delivery, you have push stuff manually to production, probably put it automatically on testing or staging or whatever you call it, uh, but do not deploy it automatically to production. Who is doing that? Okay, we're getting fewer and fewer. Um, and then who is doing continuous deployment, like automatic pushes to production, who is doing that? Okay, even, even fewer. Um, and just to keep it in mind that we've had all the passwords you need in here, so we have Agile here, we have continuous integration, okay, test everything, um, put it to testing, put it to production, and then we have even DevOps, so once you do all the things, uh, it's called DevOps, or whatever the graphic wanted to call it. Um, but I'm, depending on your background or your project, I'm always a bit skeptical, like, is continuous deployment, like, putting it automatically into production, is it really required? And I'm, I'm of the opinion, like, in some projects, it's not. Like, sometimes it might be, if you just need to be as fast as you can be because you have so much competition or it's just you live on the innovation, um, yeah, do it. This is probably helping you. But if that is not your main pain point, but for example, stability, probably don't do it. Like, at my previous company, we did automatic ordering uh, and invoicing and shipping messages of, for, for example, for supermarkets, and there it was just like, now we cannot really put this automatically into production because like, we would uh, actually test this with the live data of customers, and if we screw up, there won't be any beer or bananas tomorrow in the supermarket. And their stability kind of trumps features and the, the actual development where it's just like, okay, if this goes wrong, um, you're not just losing a few cat pictures like Facebook would, uh, but you're actually losing real stuff, so it's probably not useful for everything. Yeah, and <coughs> Jenkins, of course, everybody is using. Oh, we've, al we've already uh, asked the questions, and we asked who is using Jenkins. Um, I'm also using Jenkins, but I have my own story of, or opinion on it. Like, sometimes it's a Jerkins uh, <laughs> because it's falling on purpose, sometimes it's just junk um, because incompetence, and sometimes it's uh, Jenkins, so no discernible reason for whatever. And this is kind of what Jenkins is up to. It's, yeah. No, Jenkins is great, uh, but every now and then it just screws you. Um, features I really like is doing releases with Jenkins. Uh, so there is just a plugin, and you can see, okay, uh, I want to build it with these arguments, and I want to do, uh, do you can do dry runs and whatever. Uh, and you can just do. Uh, Maven release of your software, and Jenkins can automate all of that for you. So it will automatically push that to your, not only to your snapshot repository, but also to your release repository. It will add the git tags, it will upgrade the, the version number to the next snapshot and everything. So this I find super useful because this is super tedious um, to do it manually. And if you do not want to promote automatically, um, you can actually manually deploy stuff or promote stuff to different stages. All of this is provided by Jenkins and yeah, so you have promoted jobs and you can simply say, for example, if you package up a zip file of stuff, uh, you simply push that to the next stage and Jenkins can do all of that for you. So it doesn't need to be fully automated, which Jenkins can do as well, but it says if you just want to have some manual interaction for, for example, the production environment, you totally can do that with Jenkins. And I guess this is obvious, separate code and configuration. Um, what I found to be useful in the past is if you have your application deployed and at some point you find out, oh, I need to rotate some credentials or some, some other configuration. I do not want to rebuild my application for that. I just want to change whatever configuration around it I have, but I don't necessarily want to rebuild and re-release uh, my packages or artifacts. And we've also covered that in yeah, I didn't talk to Henry enough before the talk, because I, yeah, do not commit your credentials. Um, this is the, the super common story, like people uh, happily create a, a project on GitHub and they push their AWS credentials there and like 10 minutes later somebody grabs their AWS credentials and starts mining bitcoins. And it doesn't make any sense from a general perspective because I think you need to spend like a thousand dollars on AWS costs to make probably $50 of bitcoins, but since it's not your money you're spending, it's still a 
quite a good deal. And lots of people will do it. And from what I've heard, it's kind of an arms race because people will push their credentials and both the bad guys are scanning GitHub continuously and AWS is scanning GitHub continuously as well. Yeah. Because it's just like very expensive for them. And they will often reimburse you if you can say, hey, I did something stupid and somebody took my uh, uh, my tokens and just started mining bitcoins, they will reimburse uh, you for that. Um, so it's expensive for them and they try to avoid it, but just... Actually now, they, if, if they find something in GitHub, they disable the yeah. screen automatically for you. Yeah, but, but it's still it's kind of an arms race. Yeah. Um, and I've recently seen a case that um, you can have stuff in GISTs and nobody seems to scan GISTs automatically. Because um, I, I've seen a case where somebody uploaded something uh, to a GIST, like the credentials, and it took nearly a year for somebody else to exploit it. And I was kind of shocked, like, what has the internet come to? <laughs> <laughs> credentials are for a year and nobody's using them. Okay, next up. Which one is this? Anybody remembers <coughs> lust uh, and intense and uncontrollable <coughs> desire? And I guess most of us are guilty of that, and I always call it uh, always use the hottest chip. Um, so, yeah, just to cover it, Docker. Who is using Docker? Who is using Docker in production? Oh, quite a few actually. Um, why are you using Docker? Um, the main argument is you want to get rid of this, um, but it works on my machine. Like, I've had, or I guess everybody has had or still has this colleague who says like, but it's working on my machine. And like, without Docker, the natural reaction would be, okay, back up your email, your laptop is going to production now. Um, <laughs> because this is really the only thing you can do. Um, but again, it's probably not solving all of your problems. Because for me, Docker sometimes looks like this. Like, uh, I think this is Find Nemo where the fish want, want to escape and everybody's kind of nicely packed up like a docker container and they're floating in the water now but yeah does this solve all your problems no probably not but this is what docker gives you so if you have the, the problem of you have want to have something nicely packaged and you don't want to have the issue that oh it works on my machine you want to get rid of that it's a great solution but it's probably not the great solution for everything um, and then i really like this um, it's elegant, it's simple because it's all tires, containers, whatever. Uh, and if you understand tires or containers, uh, you can understand the whole system. Uh, the whole system is on fire, but you can understand the whole system because everything is just Docker containers. <laughs> um, yeah. And then there's this nice quote, containers will not fix your broken architecture. You are welcome. <laughs> um, which is kind of true, because I always imagine it like this. You have this big container ships and you have lots of Docker containers. And each of the Docker containers on its own is doing pretty well. Because they're just containers and they're doing their container thing. But like the entirety of things, or your entire architect is probably not doing as well as you were hoping for. So, yeah, so Docker doesn't probably solve all your problems. Or, um, there was this GDPC vulnerability. Um, unless you're using Alpine, for example, uh, you're using, I don't know, DB and Ubuntu, whatever base packages. Uh, that vulnerability still sits in your containers and once it is found, you need to re-spin all your containers. So it's just not like, okay, we'll build a container and everything is good afterwards. You probably need to re-spin them and do stuff again. Um, Josh Long, by the way, he is the developer advocate or one of the most famous ones for Spring. Um, and they have their own cloud solution and they're trying to stay away from containers, so that is why he is a bit critical of containers probably. Um, and now I know, every, some, every now and then somebody comes and says, well, you just should use Alpine. Because Alpine, they're the smart guys, they got rid of GDPC, they're using libmustl, um, which at Elastic we are currently trying to use, or we have now built our first Docker images based on that. But at least with Java or also with Node, it's a major pain. Because MustL is super nice, it's just more modern, leaner, probably more secure and everything. But it's just not as widely used and tested. And for example, Orbit Java doesn't like it at all. You only need, can use uh, OpenJDK on it. And you cannot use the JDK, but only the JRE, the runtime environment, which is probably fine for lots of projects. But again, you will need to properly test it. And we found some weird behaviors with it, and we 
started to fix it in Elasticsearch, uh, and we've got it up and running now. And we wanted to do the same for our Node application, but the Node, for example, is not yet fully supported, or at least not the Node version we wanted to use. Um, so yeah, this it's taking some more time, but it's not as simple as, oh, just use the hottest container thing and just throw your application in and it will all just work. Um, it's unfortunately, again, no silver bullet, not as simple as that. Um, and who knows that? Hitler uses Docker. <laughs> Which, this is a good one. Um, yeah, he, he asked the usual questions like, if you've never used uh, Docker in production, leave the room now, which he is just left with his four generators or whatever out of 50. And, and then you have the, the secretary standing in front and they're talking to each other. And I think in that movie, they, they says like, oh no, Hitler says like, everybody will be moved over to Windows. And they say, oh, it's not so bad because you can use Bash on Windows now. <laughs> Yeah, and then he says that, like, yeah, people run Docker on Google Compute Engine, in a VM instance, uh, that run is in a Linux container on board. <laughs> so it's kind of like containers, VM containers, or whatever, turtles all the way down. Um, yeah, I won't play the video for you now, but I can highly recommend it, like this is really entertaining and well done. And ideas what this could be, like containers are great. It's a legacy application in a container. <laughs> <laughs> and for me, it always or often feels like, hey, you have microservices and you have containers and you have this cargo cult. And Dilbert normally says it best. Like, the, the important uh, consultant comes in and they ask him, like, what should you do? And they say, uh, just imitate the successful companies and use the strategies. And yeah, first step to that is do a golf tournament. And then the boss says, wow. Profits, here we come. <laughs> uh, that is exactly what a cargo cult looks, looks like. Um, and yeah, I don't know, does anybody know Kai Kingsbury? He's um, destroying databases and distributed systems uh, on a professional level by now. And he's, he just knows what can go wrong in distributed systems. And uh, also for him, like Docker is kind of one tool, but it doesn't solve all the problems. Um, but people will always come to him, don't know his background, and say, just use Docker, it will solve all your problems. And he says, like, yeah. Siri, please uh, quiet all the people. I don't want to hear whatever suggestions they have. Um, or, um, Casey Hightower, he is also, I think he's working for Kubernetes as a developer advocate. Uh, but even he says, like, picking Kubernetes because Google is using it is just the same as just creating your own file system just because Google did. And you probably should do it the same, the same way as them, because this is what Cargo Cult looks like. And um, depending on what background you have, um, I'm always a bit skeptical, and I think, like, yeah, this is Spring background. This is not JE. Anybody from the JE side here? Uh, just a few, okay. I, I, I try not to poke too much fun about JE. <laughs> it's bad enough on its own right now, right? <laughs> but maybe you will get JE next year. We'll see. Java 1 has heated up stuff. Okay, so if you're uh, more on the spring side, um, there is Josh Long always says, uh, make Java not war, like skip the fat war files, just use a jar because you don't really need the application server. Uh, you just need Java to run your Java files and then you're good. And then probably the JDK is kind of your container plus AWS. So you have whatever bare instance you have, you have the whatever standardized JDK version you have, and then you have the Java file, and you don't have any more moving parts. And yes, you can totally dockerize that, but probably you don't have that much of a difference between your systems that Docker really pays off. Um, yeah, and since we're all the hottest shit, um, let's include serverless. Who is or who has heard of serverless? Who is using serverless already? Okay, very few. Okay, serverless in general is um, is you have one function and you just have a service that can run that function. Um, for example, the, the most famous one uh, is Amazon Lambda, where you can just provide some code which can be written in Python, Java, and by now probably in some other languages. Um, and they will either on a specific trigger, and you can have lots of external triggers, or just on a specific schedule, uh, run that one method. And it's super good for just these one-off jobs, where you just want to run it specific points in time or for specific events, you just want to run one job. For example, people have used it, you get an, an image uploaded and you want to optimize that image or rotate the image or whatever. And you don't want to run the server because 
you don't really need to provide the server, it's just like you have a bit of code and you want to have the code run somewhere. And serverless is just the, the catchy name that's stuck, even though of course there are servers in, behind it somewhere. Um, yeah, and people always make fun of the serverless <laughs> name, like, now we're a serverless architecture, next year we're up at codeless architecture, and after that we're going to architectureless architecture, because then we're kind of done, we, we've got rid of all the stuff uh, nobody needs anyway, or everybody is doing wrong. And some of the critics say, like, is it pass, platform as a service, the good old thing that kind of totally failed? Or, like, we, we could discuss that, but like, um, I, I remember, um, like, five or seven years ago or something when PaaS emerged, it was like, well, this PaaS thing is, is amazing. Nobody will run their own service anymore. And everybody will just have whatever package they have, for example, a Java file or a WAR file, and they have a service somewhere, and they will just throw it at that. And it's kind of stupid that you would want to run your own service anyway, right? But kind of time showed a different picture, and the PaaS thing, yeah, some people are using it, Heroku is still around, and some others. But it didn't really catch on, and like infrastructure as a service where you just get the virtual server and run your own stuff is still kind of the dominating factor, I would say. Um, so is this serverless thing where you just run a function, is this the new platform as a server thing? Um, some say yes, uh, but there is a nice distinction. If your pulse can uh, start in 20 milliseconds and run for half a second, and you're only built for that half second, then serverless is pass, but probably most uh, pass services did not provide this. Adrian Cockcroft, he is very well known. He was the guy at Netflix who created their own whole infrastructure and who moved um, Netflix from the service that sent you DVDs in a box to you just rent everything online and they have their highly distributed systems and uh, system and lots of other cool things. Uh, so this is definitely an interesting thing. And also at Elastic, we use the AWS Lambda functions for these one-off jobs where we just clean up stuff, where we send out <coughs> notifications, or where we just react to specific events, and it's super nice. You don't need to write a Jenkins job for everything, because that was one, one common solution in the past, where you just have Jenkins jobs and you would trigger them or you had them on a schedule. Lots of that can just be uh, put into uh, AWS Lambda, and it's way cheaper, because you just build it by the minute, and if it's just running half a minute, then you just build for that. Okay. Again, it's written here, it's kind of boring <coughs> right. Um What is essentially better than others? Um, so, yeah, you need to monitor stuff. Um, sorry for putting up the competition if you're sponsoring <laughs> the, the conference. Uh, th that was not the intention. But like, to monitor stuff, uh, is kind of important feature. Uh, don't really skip on it. So you should have some monitoring. Who is using whatever, Diamond Face, New Relic, whatever for, for monitoring? Okay, who is not using any monitoring service? Why? <coughs> I'm, I'm kidding. And, but for me, this is kind of a bit of this, this pride thing where you, you believe you have everything under control and you don't need these fancy tools. Uh, and yeah, this is just, I've used new, new Relic in the past because they were super cheap, and if you don't know it, they have a free tier on AWS, so you just need to write in and say, hey, my stuff is running on AWS, and you could get their mid-level for free. Still not sure how great it is, but free is hard to beat, obviously. So, yeah. And then another service I really like is Datadog. They also monitor all your stuff. Um, yeah, so, don't have this pride thing where I'm too good to monitor my stuff because I know what I'm doing and everything is uh, working fine. Uh, probably not use some good tooling for that. What is that? And the answer is not Kevin Spacey. <laughs> because I've got that in the past as well. Anybody remembers what his sin was? Envy. This content towards someone's straight status abilities or rewards. Um, I always say like, Hey, I know better. I will craft everything myself. Uh, you probably have this colleague who just has this not invented here syndrome where, oh, I can simply write my own parser for that. <laughs> or, I don't know. This ex colleague of mine, he, he wanted to, I think he wanted to create his own encoding and stuff. Just because he, he wouldn't read the documentation of other systems and he always thought, like, 
well, I have this problem and I don't know a good solution, so I will just write this on my own, um, which is probably not the right approach. So if you're in the Java world, I really like uh, Spring Boot, where you just have an interface, you say, okay, this is the version I want to use, this is the configuration I want to use, and these are the dependencies I need. For example, I have a web application, uh, or I have, I don't know, whatever distributed system I have, and you simply define all the components you need, and then you can download it, and it's just a set of dependencies that are known to work together well, uh, and it just provides a wrapper and kind of a standardized approach to everything. So you don't, because previously this was kind of the, the problem of the Java world, that at the beginning of the project, somebody would sit down and define all the dependencies and how everything is wired together for a week. And that is how your projects would be created. Uh, and that is kind of the thing of the past by now, like, don't do that anymore. And then, of course, the same thing is for applicable for service. Who knows? Pets versus cattle. Okay, so quite a few don't. So previously, if you had a server, it was like a pet. You kind of got the pet, you named the pet, you raised the pet by hand, and if it was sick, uh, you would care for it to take it to the doctor. And kind of the same was true for servers. Like, I can remember when I got my first server, I don't know how many years back, it, I named it and I installed all my packages and I broke it and then I fixed it and then I broke it again and I fixed it and it was kind of a life cycle and we, we had a very intimate relationship. <laughs> and the new approach is more like you treat servers like cattle. Like they don't have a name, like the herd and the cattle, you don't know the name of a specific cow. Um, they are not really raised by hand, but they are raised in an automatic fashion. And if one of the cows gets ill, you just kill it, so it doesn't infest the rest of the stock. And kind of the same thing is true for the server approach where you have cattle versus pet. Like, your servers are created automatically, they are named automatically, so you don't give them fancy names, but they just get an automatic name and probably grab a DNS entry or arrive just behind the load balancer or whatever. And if one of them misbehaves, um, you probably don't go in and debug the server for a full day, but you just say, okay, kill that server and just create me a new one that is just as good and doesn't have the problem. And yeah, we've seen there are lots of tools. Um, I'm a fan of Ansible. I have configured everything from AWS to your, my instances to the deployment. AWS can do all of it, even though like, Especially for the AWS stuff, I'm not so happy anymore, like Terraform from HashiCorp is also a nice solution, but yeah. But whatever you do, automate all the things. That is kind of definitely a good takeaway. Brad Pitt. No, it's not about Brad Pitt. Um, what is the thing? Rats. Uh, known as rage, uh, the inordinate and uncontrollable, uh, uncontrolled feelings of hatred and anger. Um, so if stuff goes wrong, um, don't lose your self-control, just stay in a focused fashion. Third thing is lock stuff. So if you have lock them locked somewhere, you can probably find stuff. Um, yeah, we do have a solution there. But most of you are using it already, that's fine. If, if you have no idea what this is, um, this is what Elastic does. Um, lower level is to ingest data. Elastic search stores it. Kibana can visualize all this stuff. Um, if the logos look strange, this is a new branding. And the egg stack has gone away. It's called now just Elastic because we had the egg, Elastic Search, Logsish, Kibana, and then we got Beats. And we tried to rename it to Elk, uh, Belk or Elk B. And we even had a logo. It was a B with elk horns, but somehow it didn't stick. And this is what the new thing is. Um, yeah, can do lots of stuff like how much traffic do you have? Where are your visitors coming from? What are your server logs? How much memory are you using? How are your servers doing? We, yeah, we don't really have the time now, but if you have questions, just come to me and I can show you all the cool stuff we can do. And the next thing is like collect errors you have. For example, one tool I really like is Sentry. Um, there is one Austrian guy involved, Armin Wonnaka, he's from the Python universe. He created Flask, for example. He's, like in Austria, nobody knows him, but internationally he's quite well known. And Sentry is super nice, like it's, it's a tool, um, I think it was born out of Discuss or something like that. 
uh, where they just wanted or they needed an application to log all the application errors and stack traces. And the nice thing of that tool is that it actually knows what is a specific stack trace and it can aggregate those together. So for example, you can see here uh, the form failed to validate whatever info or error here's something, and this error has happened eight times altogether. It has affected six users, and it has happened, I don't know, here, here, and here it seems to have happened over the last 24 hours. Or for example, here you can see something in that form failed. Maybe you pushed a, a bad change out to the form, and it failed, and it aggregates all of those failures together. They provide a hosted version, and you can, can run it on-premise because it's just open source. And it's really nice, I've used it in the past, it just aggregates all the errors you have together, and it really knows what is a single error, and groups them together, and then can alert you like, hey, a new error occurred, and then you can assign people, and then you can mark it fix, and it knows what a regression is, and all of that thing, all of these things. Okay, to conclude, we've had quite a few things. Um, not sure um, if anybody still remembers. Like, first thing we had was gluttony, which was mostly about size and modularity. Second thing was um, greed, where you had like JBoss. <laughs> don't, don't use JBoss. Uh, sloth was more the continuous whatever, but only do continuous delivery deployment that you really need and don't just follow the cult cult because it's yeah required. <laughs> um, then we had Envy. Don't can craft everything yourself. Uh, Wrath was uh, log and collect the things you really need to debug stuff. Five was also do monitoring. And last was don't always just use the hottest shit because you want to use it, but because it needs to uh, fit your business case. Um, and if you've kind of forgotten how seven if the movie looked like, there is an 8-bit version of it, which lasts like two or three minutes, and it just uh, it looks like a computer game, and it just plays through the entire movie in three minutes, uh, which is also very nice. Okay, any questions or confessions? <laughs> Who found the thing they were guilty of? Good. Repent. <laughs> Say five Hail Marys or whatever. <laughs> questions?